Dr. Patient World. We're so happy to have a special guest with us today, Dr. Bolad. Dr. Bolad, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hester, for having me on your show. Oh, it's all my pleasure. So can we get started by having you tell the audience about yourself? Absolutely. Um, I have been a cardiologist for over uh, 25 years, and um, I have been a physician uh, for over 30 years, 35 years or so. Um, I practice uh, cardiology in a teaching hospital uh, in Indianapolis, and I deal with all sorts of uh, uh, cardiac disease and heart health disease. Uh, I am a cardiologist. I am also an interventional cardiologist, meaning I do procedures like uh, cardiac catheterizations, revascularization of the coronary arteries, and I help all uh, sort of patients with interventions that are needed for their heart. So with that background, I try to help as many people as possible, uh, both through my hospitals and also like forums like what you are having now. So I just inform the public about uh, heart health and heart disease. Right. And so the goal is to teach people things so they don't end up in the cath lab. Absolutely right. So what do you want to share with the audience that um, can help them prevent finding themselves looking up at you one day? So the, the common thing really is uh, to uh, the commonest heart disease is coronary artery disease uh, in people who are like in middle and um, age and above. Obviously, as you know, heart disease is a wide spectrum. It kind of came from infancy and these are usually congenital heart disease. Uh, some diseases you are born with and manifest in the early years of life, like teenage years. Uh, but the majority of people who are healthy from a heart standpoint start to develop heart disease as the years pass by. And when they are in their 40s and 50s, they are predisposed to the commonest cause of heart disease, which is coronary artery disease, which manifests with uh, chest pain, angina, and this sometimes can progress to heart attacks. So this is the commonest cause uh, for heart disease. And with heart attacks, they can lead to malfunction or reduced function of the heart, and it leads to heart failure. So this is the commonest subset of heart disease that we see, and that is the commonest cause worldwide. I remember back in medical school, they did autopsy studies on teenagers who were in car wrecks, and they already found the beginnings of coronary disease. And I found that very surprising that they were able to find that at such a young age. And I think a lot of people don't realize this is not something that just happens. You wake up and you're 55 and all of a sudden you have this. There is progression of uh, disease over time. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the people that you've seen who are younger? I mean, I've, I've seen people who've had significant heart attacks in their 30s and that was shocking for a while but people don't understand that you don't have to be an elderly person to succumb to this the youngest person with a heart attack that i have treated was um, 17 or 18 years of age at that time i was practicing in london in the united kingdom mm -hmm. and they activated the cast lab and i when, when they told me about the history, said 17 year old student, I said, I'm, I'm not sure this is correct. Then they sent me the EKGs, and the patient had, he was actually a student from Malaysia studying in England, mm -hmm. and he got a heart attack. So I have seen it as young as um, at that age group. So um, oh, people who have got coronary disease manifesting at such a young age, um it's either they don't take care of themselves or they have got a family history uh family history is very important and i take it this is just like the lottery of life you are born and you don't have really control over what your parents history is like and as you know um and is that when you have got a family history then you are going to predisposed to it. So um, 
for people who have got, for the audience here, have got history of coronary disease and heart attacks, they have to be extremely careful about what they do and try to reduce the risk factors for progression of coronary, any coronary disease, such as if they have got history of high blood pressure, they have to control the blood pressure. They have to eat healthy, meaning low fat, uh, low red meat, high white meat, eat vegetables, sort of the Mediterranean diets that we do advocate. They have also to keep fit all the time and try to exercise about 150 minutes per week in different forms. So if you have got a family history, then you need to be extremely careful about reducing your uh, risk factors. Now, if you don't have a family history, still you have to be um, vigilant and careful not to develop a heart disease and coronary disease on the long run. Smoking, as we know, is a number one cause for progression of coronary disease. So if you're a smoker and you really want to care for your heart, you need to think seriously about stopping it. The same factors that we mentioned, like high blood pressure, high lipids have to be controlled, eat healthy. Uh, if you are diabetic, you have to be treated aggressively so that your uh, blood glucose is well controlled, not too high, not too low. I keep telling uh, my patients is that look after your heart and your body as if you're looking after your car. It's it's really a full-time job. You're not going to be healthy and having a healthy body just coincidental. If you want your car to last you for a long period of time, you have to be careful for that car to look after it, not to crash it. You have to change the engine oil regularly to get it the right engine oil spare parts, anything that goes wrong, you have to treat it immediately with the genuine spare parts. And you have to make sure to maintain it regularly by servicing it. So that's how I look at our bodies and our, our heart. If you want your body and your heart to last you for a long time, meaning just similar to your car, you need really to work hard on that. It is not going to be a coincidence that you are healthy and you are fit when other people around you at a certain age are not as fit. Someone is doing something right and someone is not taking care of that part. So this is what I would like to um, let my patients and the audience know that it's um, to be healthy, you need really to take an active role in your cardiac health and in your health in general. So this is what I would like people to think about when they are talking about or thinking about having a healthy health, heart, and a healthy body. I really like that analogy because people are so serious about their cars. They'll spend a ton of money on a very expensive car. They'll, they'll wash it regularly. They'll do all sorts of things to keep it going. And so that was an excellent analogy. And when it comes to their health, they don't often have that same degree of concern, so to speak. And take Absolutely. it for granted. But with the pandemic, people have moved from being active, going to work, to okay, now I'm at home all the time. So, what would you say to people who went from uh, a moderately active lifestyle at work to sitting in front of a computer all day? So, there are different ways to get around that, even if people change their working work environment. Um, working more from home rather than going and moving around, there are certain ways to get around that. You can take in the evenings or in the mornings, like a walks or jogs, if that permits. Uh, you need also to change. It's not only physical, it's also um, psychological. You cannot be and mental. You cannot just be confined in a place. So you need to have time for yourself in order to be able to walk and do other things. You can have also your, lots of people have got treadmills or stationary bikes in their home and they exercise. I do that sometimes, weekends, cold weather. I just try to 
keep myself by on a, on a stationary bike. It's a very soft thing, but I, I try to get as much as possible uh, of my exercise. If I that week, I haven't worked a lot. Some people also try to work with now with these desks that uh, you are standing while uh, you are doing work. It's good for musculoskeletal, it's good for the heart you're doing, your, your muscles are working. So um, what I'm saying is that it's the same way that you have adapted to changing from going to work. You can also adapt also with the work, with the home environment to create some time uh, to dedicate it for your heart and for your body in general. Um, as I mentioned, uh, keeping a healthy heart and a healthy body uh, is a part-time job. So you really need to put work on it in order to be achieved. So that is what I would I would say. Okay. You brought up another very important point, and that is the issue of smoking. I remember when, uh, mainly when I was doing residency and so forth, but even into the years of private practice, a lot of people have a mindset that, you know, my uncle smoked till he was 95 years old. He never got lung cancer. People are so focused on lung cancer. And I don't think the general public realizes that lung cancer is not what's likely to get you with cigarette smoking. It is the cardiac disease. So, so yeah, this is, this is true. And I hear it all the time uh, when I advise someone, mm -hmm. uh, tell them usually, I'm sure you have been told that stop smoking etc and these are people coming to a heart clinic therefore they already have got heart disease and i get not uncommonly answered just like what you said oh my parent or my brother or my whoever has been smoking for a long time and they are fine um it doesn't happen to 100 percent of people it happens to a great majority of people and you never know that relative of yours might have had blockages elsewhere, not in the heart. So, uh, and when we say about smoking here, when we refer to cardiovascular health and heart attacks, but this is actually all the vascular all over the uh, system, all over the body. This includes your brain, blocking your blood flow to the brain from the neck or to the arts of the brain. The arteries going to the intestines or the arteries going to the legs or to the arms. So this is widespread damage. It doesn't just concentrate on the arteries of the heart. So you are definitely causing a significant damage to causing blockage. In addition, even if there is no blockage, it's well known and it's well documented that damage to the lining of the vessel of the wall causes lots of endothelial dysfunction and makes these arteries not um, working the way they should. And this has got multiple manifestations in different parts of the body as well. So it doesn't need to be like the acute blockage with chest pain or acute blockage with a stroke. There is still significant damage and your body will not be functioning as it should do. And once the damage occurs, it occurs. So you can't just move the clock back. You can then try to reduce the progression by medications, etc. cetera. Uh, therefore, um, don't go to the point that so much damage has occurred and then uh, that's it for you. You just have to put up with it. So there are ways to prevent that from happening or occurring in the first place. So that's what I would say to people who think that for one reason or another, they are not going to get affected by the smoking. It's going to catch you one way or another. And the peripheral artery disease, the disease of the blood vessels in the legs that you mentioned, I don't think people understand that it can lead to amputations. And Absolutely. If you lose your leg, you can get a prosthetic device, but that's not the time to realize that you could have done something differently. This is absolutely true. Uh, peripheral vascular disease is very common. Uh, to different extents as well, actually probably more common than cardiac disease because the arteries in the leg are the longer arteries and therefore with the length, uh, there occurs the likelihood more of disease developing there. The saphenous artery in our uh, upper leg is the longest artery in the body and it's one of the commonest to get blocked 
and when it gets blocked, then there is collateral circulation to try to maintain flow. And then gives rise to significant limitation in the ability to mobilize. You get pain and claudications whenever you want to do brisk walking or um, exercise. Then you as a person are limited in your mobility. So uh, you don't want to be getting to that stage that you cannot care after yourself or you cannot mobilize uh, because of the damage sustained by smoking or other risk factors like diabetes or high blood pressure, uh, etc. Certainly, and that's a cycle you can get into. If you can't walk around because you have the claudication, the pain in your legs when you walk because of the blockage, then that's going to impact your ability to improve your blood pressure control, the diabetes, cholesterol, all of those things. So it's like a vicious cycle. Absolutely. Let's talk Absolutely. a bit about cholesterol. Could you explain to the audience the different types of cholesterol and the significance of each? Absolutely. So uh, cholesterol, people, when they refer to it, they refer to all like one subject or one uh, chemical. Uh, cholesterol is partly in our body, is partly manufactured in our body and partly um, also ingested in the food. There are different types of cholesterol. People, when they talk, they generally refer about the total cholesterol. So there are subsets of cholesterol, which is a harmful cholesterol. And we have got another subset, which is uh, the good cholesterol. So, and there are ratios in which ones uh, are um, acceptable. Now, for the audience, they don't need to get into the exact details, but they need to know that there is some good cholesterol that you can be improved either by healthy eating or by medications. They that can improve the healthy cholesterol and lower the bad cholesterol. Obviously, if you eat lots of fatty food, then the likelihood of you having the bad cholesterol is going to be high, and therefore that's going to impact uh, the arteries in the body and cause the same damage as we have been talking about, for example, leading to blocking, just like smoking, etc. So there are two types of cholesterol for our audience here. The bad cholesterol is the one that we need to lower down uh, by uh, eating healthy and by if is you can't bring it down by eating healthy and by medications. And the good cholesterol known as the HDL cholesterol that we need to increase also by eating healthy or by medications um, uh, that would bring that up to protect us. Now, uh, some people are predisposed to high cholesterol levels and we need to aggressive medications to try to bring, it, bring this down. Uh, but generally, what I would say for the majority of uh, our audience, they do not need to go to extreme treatments uh, regarding uh, uh, bring the cholesterol. I know now currently as we're talking here and there's lots of debate about statins, etc. But people don't understand that lots of the times you, if you are eating healthy and are not eating very food, etc., then you might not even need to go there to try to lower your uh, cholesterol level with medications. So that's what I would say here to our audience who are, who are listening to us. So now the LDL, the bad cholesterol, based on your current status, um, is there a difference between the goal? For instance, somebody who already has established heart disease versus a typically healthy 50, let's say they're both 50. Um, does the LDL go different at all? So the way I look at it um, for my patients who come to clinic here, I mean, is it the LDL say it's is it above 100 I need to bring it down or is it above, bring it down as low as 70 or below? So I look as a patient, as a person in front of me as a general, as you are aware, we have got lots of risk factor calculators that tell us about the risk factors. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way if you want to be precise about about it, but if you get someone, for example, who is fit, young, um, fairly active, uh, no family history, uh, not smoker, etc., and I find, for example, his LDL cholesterol above 100 or slightly above 100, not phenomenally high, then I would just say, just 
ask him just to watch his diet and keep doing what he's doing. On the other hand, if I find someone with the same level, but he's got family history or he's diabetic or he's a smoker, etc., that's someone I would go uh, ahead and be as aggressive as possible as reducing the cholesterol in his body because his or her risk factors are quite high. And therefore, that needs to be controlled probably to bring the LDL cholesterol to 70 or less. So it's individualized. It's not one number that fits every person. Every person we look at to into, we have to assess the risks of the high cholesterol and also the risks and benefits of the medications that we're giving them. Uh, so uh, that's how uh, I look at it. There isn't one size that fits all. Every person is different, and we take that into consideration in our assessment. So I want to talk about blood pressure for a moment. What do you think the role of home blood pressure monitoring is in optimizing blood pressure control? I really think it's I really think it's very important. This is my personal opinion. It's very important. That's um when you when we see a patient in clinic. Um, as you know, uh, some people, you will tell them, all oh, your blood pressure is high. Tell your doctor, I have been measuring it at home all the time. It never has been like that. Exactly. And, and some people really are just nervous when they come to the doctor. And that's uh, for our audience here, we call this like the white coat syndrome. Uh, it's not always true, but it is something really to consider not to jump and prescribe medications to everyone who has got a single high reading. So what I tell my patients usually is that, can you please measure your blood pressure twice a day for a week at home and let me know or call my nurse and give her the reading and she'll give it to me and then I will let you know. So I think that this is a very important uh, diagnostic test that we have now uh, at home to do the blood pressure recordings. As you know, uh, in the past, or still we do it sometimes, we get the 24-hour blood pressure recordings in which day and night they have got wearing a blood pressure cuff and it takes your blood pressure regularly and we see that whether it dips at night and what the levels are on the average exam, etc. But I really think that the if you keep measuring your blood pressure correctly at home at stable conditions, and that's the condition you're living in all the time, then that would be a very good indicator whether you need treatment or not, or you need modifications or not, for example, like reducing um, the uh, salt intake, etc. Uh, also now, things have really, um, with the invent of technology, and I keep telling my patients this all the time, I not only look at the blood pressure, I tell them, look at what the pulse rate is and what your blood pressure machine tells you. Is your pulse regular or irregular? Because as you know, the incidence of atrial fibrillation increases with age. And people who are above 70 years of age, like 10% of them have got atrial fibrillation. And this causes blood clots in the heart and leads to strokes and other embolization and symptoms and diseases. So for our audience, atrial fibrillation is irregularity of the heartbeat, and it's completely irregular, irregular. And it happens due to changes in the heart or in, in our bodies as we age. And the incidence increases, and that's why the incidence of strokes are higher with age. This is one of the factors, the commonest factor, is development of atrial fibrillation. So these blood pressure machines now, I not only ask my patients to look at the numbers of the blood pressure, but I also would like them to tell me about the pulse rate and whether the machine says it's regular or irregular. Even to go further now these days, and lots of people come to my clinic with these smart watches, I keep also asking them the same thing. What does your uh, smart watch tell you? Has it ever told you your pulse is irregular, etc.? So this is just with the advent of technology. Lots of things can be done at home, blood pressure and pulse monitoring, uh, which are major causes of heart disease. You brought up something about the smartwatch. I actually had a friend who diagnosed herself with atrial fibrillation because of that smartwatch. I, 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 I get this I get this very commonly. 
in, in clinic, a patient come out or just say calls by nurse and say, well, my watch is telling me my pulse is irregular. And not uncommonly, they are correct. When we do tests, sometimes when you get lots of ectopic beats, it still is irregular, but they are not in atrial fibrillation. But then we proceed to do the medical tests, like do the heart monitors, the halters, or the Z patches, etc., to monitor their heart over a long period of time. And sometimes, well, lots of the time, they are correct. It's atrial fibrillation. So this is something which is technology really helping um, people in the general public. Is that you can intervene before the clots form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Save somebody's life or prevent them from spending the rest of their life in a nursing home. Absolutely. Absolutely true. Well, your information has been invaluable. Now, heart disease is such, plays such a major role. Um, I've had people, those relatives who died of heart disease, heart disease really impacts so many people. And it's wonderful that we have the technology and the information to catch it early or even possibly prevent it. So Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on. How would you like people to reach you? Well, they can reach me either through my YouTube channel. Um, it's Dr. Bolad, youtube.com, Dr. Bolad Cardiology. Uh, I get lots of questions through um, um, almost every day. I get like uh, quite a few questions from YouTube. Um, I also, um, they can, I do answer all my uh, questions all the time. I also, uh, people can visit my website, drbolad.org, and they can ask me questions anytime. And I always reply to them. I have got people really from all over the world, really, who reach out to me regarding questions about cardiac disease, and I do help them all the time. So drbola.org is a website, or through my YouTube channel, which is uh, Dr. Bola Cardiology. I get questions every day. Today, I have already answered five or six questions already from different people. So I'm going to put these sites um, at the end, there's going to be a screen after the interview with all of your information, contact information, so people can follow up. And I thank you so very much for sharing this valuable information. Well, it's a pleasure, uh, Dr. Hester, and I'm happy to help anytime. Anytime uh, anyone needs uh, cardiology or heart disease related questions answered, I'm more than happy to help anytime. You have a blessed day. Bye-bye. And same to you. And same to you. Take care. Bye-bye.